Thank you, everybody, for joining me today. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about today, um, just on the relationship between open education and professional de development for librarians and educators. I wanted to share a little bit about my own experiences and hopefully um, encourage other people to pursue opportunities regarding professional development in this growing field of open education. All right, so there are a lot of benefits to professional development um, for us as educators, for us as people, for us as leaders who are always growing. Um, first, you can, of course, meet leaders in the world of open ed. You will see the same names <laughs> very often, and soon these names will be very, very familiar to you as you um, kind of explore the landscape of open education. Um, and you can develop a lot of relationships with them too, as you, the world of open education can start off, it could seem very small at first, but then of course we could see that there are so many people interested and you could just continuously meet growing innovators in this field. Uh, next, you can find your own leadership style. Um, this is very important for us as professionals to see what kind of leader we want to be. Maybe we want to um, change the way we educate people, um, maybe get more experience public speaking, maybe get more experience um, teaching, things like that. So it's great for your own personal growth, too, as you um, kind of navigate um, who you want to be in this profession. And of course, next, um, learning new vocabulary is so so important to one's own professional development, especially in open education. There's a lot of um, vocab that you'll see over and over again. Um, that is a vocab that's being used um, for definitions, for um, new technology, things like that. So growing your own vocabulary <laughs> is very important as we develop as professionals too. And of course, for those who are um, on the faculty track as librarians who may be um, going up for tenure, um, whether you're early in your career or not, um, the professional development always looks good on your resume. So if you want to spruce up your CV, make it look more appealing to employers or to a tenure review, or even just add your own portfolio and to see your own growth, professional development, of course, always looks good on your resume. And then uh, last but not least, giving back to your own community. Uh, open education is very focused on um, public service uh, for students and educators alike and also faculty. Uh, so to give back to your community, to um, encourage students to find these kind of zero cost options, it's always great to encourage faculty if you're a librarian and you're working very closely with faculty as a liaison maybe, or even as an educator yourself, if you want to encourage um, others to become uh, um, open educational resource authors, that is a great way to give back to your community. Another way, of course, also is by your own work. If you do um, research yourself, if you're into publishing, um, I'm a scholarly communications librarian, so I'm always <laughs> looking at publishing. So, of course, publishing is another way to give back to your community. But of course, with, about, with the uh, benefits of professional development, of course, there's challenges too. Uh, one challenge that I've noticed uh, with myself and, and a few um, other librarians I work with is that there's always this um, question of what's next. Okay, um, I just finished this conference. I just published here. What's next? What do I have to do? I can't have this big a, a gap in my resume. And so, of course, there's always that question of what's next in terms of um, trends in open education, too. So like, oh, what's next? What's the new vocabulary? What's the new technology buzz? So that can be very overwhelming sometimes when you're continuously looking at, at what's in the future, what's coming up next, and not being mindful of what's kind of happening in the present. That, that's another um, issue as, as well. And of course, I'm sure we've all experienced this too, administrative buy-in. Sometimes administrators at the top level, sometimes even the administrators right above you, they do not get it. <laughs> they do not get open education they are just not interested in it they just feel like it's a waste of time and sometimes you can't even get an elevator pitch in with some people you just can't even get that little foot in the door in with open education of course another big issue is time time constraints um things like reading oers doing professional development whether it's on your your own time or um after office hours time is always of the essence, it seems, right? So it would be difficult to kind of balance your um, 
your time to do professional development with your own activities. I know, especially um, if you are a department of one in many ways, um, I'm technically a department of one in scholarly communications at my university. I've been departments of one <laughs> in other libraries too. And so I know personally that balance is always, um, is always hard to keep track of. Uh, next, money. Money is always a big thing. Money ties, um, money and budget ties into administrative buy-in too. Sometimes there are no hours enough in the day. And then, of course, there's sometimes not enough dollars in the day either. So um, when you're trying to get um, funding for, let's say, conference presentation or um, funding for um, a research project you want to do, sometimes there's just nothing available and you have to pivot what you want to do. And like I mentioned before, staffing, if you're a staff of one and you're wearing many, many hats and juggling a lot of things, that of course is going to be a huge issue too when you have maybe no one else to rely on or if you do have people to rely on, to rely on they're swamped with other things too. And so if you want a conference buddy or um, maybe you want to develop a community of practice and you find that you just can't get others involved. That's another roadblock that um, I definitely faced too in my experience as a department of one. All right, so here's my, uh, just a brief background on my own experience with open education. So in my previous institution, I was the um, reference librarian and archivist for the General Theological Seminary, which is right in New York City. And so as a part of um, the seminary, we were members of ATLA, which is the, American Theological Library Association. And so after I worked there for a little bit, I became more involved with ATLA and I um, became a part of their scholarly communication and digital initiatives committee and try saying that five times fast. Um, I was there for about a year and then we kind of released our own um, OER grant. So there's actually two parts of the grant. One is the innovation grant, which is where um, participants would take and OER that already exists and remix it for their own purposes. It could be um, a regular OER textbook, it could be a lib guide, anything like that, but taking something that already exists and remake, remixing it for um, their own course. And then um, the second one is the ELLA Invention Grant. This is the one that my colleague and I were recipients of. This one is to create a completely new OER from scratch. And so um, for our invention grant, um, and as part of the grant in total, it had to be between one librarian and one faculty member. So my um, faculty member was Dr. Ann Silver. Uh, she was uh, the director of the um, Center for Christian Spirituality. So for our invention grant, we created an OER um, using our archives uh, to create a textbook. Um, basically on the history of the Center for Christian Spirituality. And this was used in two um, spiritual direction courses at the seminary. After I won the grant, um, I got really excited about OBRs. Um, I wanted to learn more. I had a really good foundation through ATLA, but like I said, with the trends <laughs> in open education, I just wanted to know more. And so um, I applied to the Spark Open Education Fellowship. And um, I was named a uh, fellow for their 2022 to 2023 cohort. I'm actually in the last couple of weeks of the fellowship. It officially ends on May 26th. <laughs> so we are, um, we're getting to the finish line and it was a, an entire year program. And so I will talk a little bit more about the Spark Open Education Fellowship. And before I start, let me just say my experience was just so wonderful. The instructors and everyone else in the cohort we're just so knowledgeable, so supportive, and just so excited about open education. And if you're not familiar with SPARC, um, SPARC um, stands for Scholarly Publishing and Academic Research Consortium. And so they work a lot with OERs. Um, they've worked at the federal level. Um, they develop um, initiatives themselves too, and they're an absolutely a fantastic team. And so they are the ones that host the Open Education Fellowship. Um, so it's a one-year program. So we started in September and uh, now we're 
ending in May, so just about one um, academic year. And each cohort has about 15 or so people to it. Um, their first cohort, I believe, was back in 2015. And you can see in these early cohorts in the uh, cohort um, photos, they're actually in person. But of course, with, um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, they've switched entirely to virtual. Um, also, another thing to uh, remember also, um, since they are virtual, um, they're open to anyone in North America. So we did have quite a few fellows actually in this cohort from um, Canada. For the first semester, um, basically they taught us everything there is to know about OERs. Um, pretty much every definition you can imagine, every um, initiative at the government level, um, initiatives more at local state levels to pretty much anything you want to know the big names of oer also um everything everything you wanted to know about oers open um pedagogy everything like that that is basically what was uh, what was packed into this semester and the um the kind of uh, format of the fellowship too was um, discussion board posts. We did that through Slack. And so weekly, um, we would have weekly discussions where the instructors would post a couple of questions. So of course we would post our answers and then um, uh, reply to other people's posts as well. Uh, we also had um, a Zoom call every Friday. These were optional, but um, I went to as many as I can because it was great just to put um, names to faces, um, see people kind of face-to-face -face on Zoom, see our instructors in person too, being able to ask questions. And the way that these weekly calls worked too was we would kind of um, use our soft discussion as a starting off point. And our instructors would give, um, for the first half, we give um, like a low lecture based on whatever we were discussing. Then the second half was um, open to discussion amongst us, um, depending on how many people were in the discussion room. Uh, we would uh, go into breakout rooms or sometimes we would just all stay in the same room and, and just go around the room and discuss. So for semester two, we still kept with the discussion board posts and the weekly calls. These were structured a little bit differently. For semester two, we had to break off into pairs and we had to um, choose a week where we would lead the discussion calls. So um, actually my discussion call um, with my partner was a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> and um, we did it on OERs and vocational awe. If you're not familiar with vocational awe, it's a very interesting concept um, developed by um, Fotazi Etar. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. But um, uh, we discussed basically the connection with open education and also the term open washing. Um, just a brief intro, open washing just means that um, a lot of publishers now and authors too are really getting into the hype of oh we are they think oh wow you know this is really popular let's kind of um let's kind of capitalize on this and so now anything that might be slightly free is now open when maybe it doesn't really fit the definition of open and so when uh, it's kind of like greenwashing too how we see um greenwashing with um with a lot of um environmental initiatives that might not be completely environmentally friendly but still they want the label Another part of semester two is um, our capstone project. So the capstone project is actually something that you start working on in semester one. With semester one, um, you have a capstone roadmap. Uh, and with this roadmap, um, you basically um, just answer weekly um, questions on it just to get you thinking about the capstone project. Um, some of the questions would include, um, OK, who are the stakeholders that are involved with your capstone project? What, um, what format is it going to take? Are you going to do a webinar? Are you going to create a lib guide? Are you going to have um, a community of practice? Are you going to do any of those? So um, semester one is when you really start thinking and planning, and then semester two, um, you actually put it into practice. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about my capstone project here. Um, so we're going to play the... Um, the um, expectation versus reality game. <laughs> um, so uh, my plan was to host a, a colloquy at my institution. I wanted to give a presentation for the entire community. So faculty, staff, students, alumni, um, board members, all of that. I wanted to do a presentation where I would talk about um, uh, Dr. Silver and I working on our OER and then lead into a discussion of um, 
how OERs, the creation of OERs, um, can lead to faculty and student success. And so, I've, of course, I had this grand plan that, you know, it's going to be this great big function. Everyone will get together and my like, people have those delightful moments of, oh, well, yeah, we need to do more open initiatives here. So that was my plan. And um, the reality turned out a little bit different. I still had um, the presentation that I planned to do. However, um, I ended up presenting at the ATLA annual conference a couple of months ago. Um, I presented um, my original presentation there. And um, the reality was actually a little bit better than I anticipated because um, if I were to do my, my presentation at my seminary, it's a very small seminary, um, I would probably have reached maybe about 50 people in total, but um, probably even less than that, if we're being realistic, probably maybe even around 20. However, at ATLA, um, over 50 people attended. Um, I think my final number was right around the 75 to 80 marks. So I was actually able to um, share my ideas with more people in the end. And um, so in the end, I was very happy happy that even though I did have to do um, that pivoting, I was still able to do my original presentation and still get a, um, a, a pretty decent sized audience. All right, um, for just a little bit more details on my um, capstone project. Um, so you might be thinking like, oh, why did you have to pivot? What happened was our seminary was going through a um, um, change where they were merging with another seminary, actually Virginia Theological Seminary, they were merging together. And so there were a lot of growing pains and a lot of questions that kind of weren't answered. So in this time of transition, this was going on right about um, December to January is when the real big changes happened. Um, all the presentations were basically canceled. Um, any colloquy I was going to do, any other faculty um, webinars, anything like that, all canceled because of the transition. Um, also, my I was a department of one, and the library and the library we were merging with was actually a department of I think six or seven full timers plus part timers and and student workers as well and support staff. And so there there was that question up in the air where would my job even be around in the fall semester? So um, I thankfully was able to get um, a job here at Excelsior as a scholarly communications librarian, and I. Couldn't be happier, and um, I'm so happy that Spark actually um, kind of opened up that opportunity to one of the reasons why I was getting hired. That they said that they were so excited about my application was actually working with um, Spark. And so for my Atla presentation, I basically spoke about um, my experience winning the um, OER grant with my colleague. Um, I talked about the grant writing process, how the application was very, very seamless, and we were able to um, kind of get that done pretty quickly. Um, and then, of course, how OERs, how creating, um, how faculty creating OERs and creating them and also remixing them, reusing them, can lead to um, their own success as educators and for their own profession professional development, but also student success also that goes beyond textbook savings. And then, of course, um, as part of my presentation, I was looking towards the future, too. I spoke um, I, I, I spoke a little bit about my um, about my um, entrance into Spark and my involvement with Spark and everything like that, and then also looking to the future about what else I wanted to do in terms of being an OER leader. Um, so I did learn a few lessons <laughs> while in Spark and kind of going through that um those big changes in my anniversary in my um old seminary too uh first one is definitely be open to change um if you would have told me in the beginning of my spark um my spark development that um i would be having a new job by the new year i probably wouldn't have believed it i wouldn't i i, I just wouldn't i i couldn't picture myself any other place um, by then before those changes happened. Um, have a support system too. So whether that's your colleagues, whether it's your spouse, your family, friends, whether it's your pet, um, lean into those support systems because like I said, it can get it can get very overwhelming when you're juggling uh, your own professional development with your day-to-day -day activities and also um, things like family responsibilities. Um, those things like that can get very overwhelming. So I um, I encourage you to lean on those support systems when you can. 
Um, and finally, be the leader that you want to be. Um, that could change in the future. It could change even an hour from now, and that's perfectly okay. I mentioned Clifton Strengths here because uh, one of the first things we did as a cohort in Spark uh, was for our first um, our first semester, we took the uh, Clifton Strengths um, test, and that basically um, tells you uh, where your leadership strengths are. And so um, uh, for the second semester too, we uh, talked a lot about um, our strengths and our weekly discussion calls were actually part, um, actually discussed a lot about um, individual strengths and how many people um, had certain ones in the cohort, um, which ones were over um, over representative in the cohort and others that weren't represented at all. Um, so a couple of the Clifton uh, strengths that you can kind of um, see if you ever take the test is um, achievement is one. Um, I know I'm an achiever <laughs> um, based on the test. So uh, achievers like achieving things for their own sake. We don't necessarily think about um, the benefits of them in the long term. We just like that that feeling of accomplishment that comes with it um, once we finish that task and actually achieve it. But then, of course, we have to think about um, how that will affect us professionally in the future, too. But if you find that you're an achiever, things like the Spark Fellowship are great because it gives, gives you such a wonderful sense of accomplishment. All right, so uh, when we look at future opportunities, um, I encourage you when you're when you're looking at these professional development options as um oer leaders um take on that role as advocate in your institution whether your institution has never heard of open education and open pedagogy or if maybe they've been doing um zero textbook cost, cost courses for years um take on that role if you if you feel comfortable in doing so if you have the time if you have the mental bandwidth do that become an OER oh, we are advocate at your institution and see who else is interested too and, and see what you can accomplish that way. And of course, remembering with that, um, balance your commitments. Um, it gets very, very overwhelming, of course, sometimes, uh, like I mentioned, when you are a department of one, <laughs> um, it can get very, um, very challenging balancing your um, commitments between OER, especially at this moment in your job description too. Um, I do have OERs as part of my current job description, but if you are starting from an institution that has no background in OERs and you want to take on that role, um, that's going to lead, that's going to add to your responsibilities. So be mindful of those things too. And um, of course, once again, build your own community. If you find that you don't um, have a lot of buy-in at your institution, Take a look at um, at some of these other um, organizations that you can get involved in. If you want to get involved in Spark, if you want to go through the American Library Association, if you have other committees that you're on, look to those communities too. It doesn't have to necessarily be in your institution. And of course, as you as you're doing these um, open access um, development opportunities, um, you'll build a new community with that too. I did want to mention really quickly too that in addition to Spark, there are other professional um, development opportunities um, related just to OER. Um, one would be a Library Juice Academy. They have uh, courses um, on OER. Um, those are great one-shot courses that take, um, I think they're about four weeks in length. Um, so that'd be great if you wanted um, either a quick intro or even just a quick refresher on OER to keep that kind of on your radar. Those are great. Um, also, the Open Education Network has a um, certificate in OER, and um, they are tangentially related to the, I believe they're pronounced Quantum Polytechnic University that's actually located in, in Canada. They have an open education um, professional development program, too. And um, if you were, um, if you completed that um, OEN certificate or even Spark, you get credit for a couple of classes through that program too. Uh, one final one, I know um, the Open Global Network, I believe it's called, um, they have a research fellowship that's actually open right now. Um, they're taking applications until July, so and, or until June, I'm sorry. And um, so there are a lot of um, opportunities for OER, for, your, uh, for open education and your own professional development. So um, I definitely encourage everyone to really dive in, see what speaks to you, what speaks to you as a leader, what speaks to your own passions and interests, and really dive in. And I 
can't speak highly enough of the SPARC program, but of course there's always um, other options for you too. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, I'm happy to take any, any questions.